Heavenly Father, we come before your presence right now, Lord. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, and our King, to bring before you our petitions, to offer you our worship, praise, and honor for your name. Lord, it is perhaps the wish of every one of us here that our last breath, when we close our eyes, to die in your presence, Lord, and to open it again in your presence. How we long for the day when we shall look on your face and turn faith into sight. And Lord, we know that you are true always, always true to your promises to your people. And so we lay hold on all these things. And we open our hearts before you, Lord, in praise and thanksgiving and in asking you, Lord, to pardon the offenses that you find in us. Lord, this morning we pray for this service. We pray that your spirit will be among us, with us, in us. And that you will anoint Brother Jerry's lips as he gives us your word, Lord. And not only that, that you off, open our, our ears and remove the scales from our eyes, whatever they are. Also, we bring before you, Lord, our prayers for our brethren, who, because of the frailty of this human body that we live in right now, are suffering. We miss those who are not with us today. You know who they are, Lord. You know your people. You know them by name. You have known us before the foundation of this world. You have written our names in your Lamb's Book of Life. And we trust that your blood, O oh Lord, has covered us and purchased us and redeemed us as we come before your presence, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It is certainly with joy in my heart that I look out upon you this morning, considering the real privilege that it is to come together in the house of the Lord and look unto the things of God that we would be strengthened and encouraged and built up in, in his service and in the experience of our life. I trust this morning that we recognize the great blessing that is ours to close out the things of life for just a little while and, and truly consider life eternal, the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today of particular mention being a day that society in and of itself, perhaps even beyond that, the world sets aside time to, to consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a, it's a glorious thing to consider all that is contained in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And oftentimes I think we give consideration to that biblical truth in a a very futuristic sense, that it's something that we'll be a beneficiary of in time that is yet to come. I would have you to know this morning that the Bible teaches that the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead is the same power that resides within you by which you believe in Jesus Christ being raised from the dead. We're blessed of the Lord to live lives empowered by the resurrection. And giving proper consideration to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and all that's contained in it. And basically, the biblical truth of the matter is, is that because he is risen, we too will arise. Uh, giving under, uh, understanding and consideration of that, it should truly motivate us in, in our lives of service unto the Lord and, and to one another, recognizing that we serve God as we serve each other in the experience of life. The resurrection is a, a Bible doctrine from which I think all things uh, lead to. Um, if it's not for the resurrection, the Apostle Paul tells us in the Corinthian letter that our preaching is vain, our faith is vain. He goes even all the way to the point of saying, you are yet in your sins. Church, that we would understand this morning that by God's mercy, the resurrection was a very public event. It took place uh, that many would see it and then that Christ even walked upon the earth uh, for 40 days after he was resurrected, that it would be beheld that he had raised triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And then we have the spirit that dwells with us today that 
cries out repeatedly that he is not here, he is risen. He was delivered for our offenses, he was raised again for our justification. And this morning, while the subject that's on my mind or the uh, place in scripture that I will go to might not be the conventional resurrection message, if God would bless with liberty of thought and bless me to contain uh, the, the lesson that's before us, we'll certainly arrive at the resurrection. Because if it's not for the resurrection, we have no reason for being here. There's no purpose for us being here at all if it's not for the resurrection. But that God would bless us to consider it in the future, but that we would be blessed of the Spirit to bring it right where you sit this morning and recognize that we live lives empowered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we've been in a study over the last number of weeks out of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, and I'm going to go back there this morning, and again, like I said, it's not what you might consider the conventional resurrection message on Easter morning. Um, I hope this morning that God will bless us to uh, consider this lesson and the importance of it in, in our lives and how we view our service unto him and how we live our lives to his honor and glory and that we will come out of that consideration with seeing none other than Jesus Christ and him risen because that is truly that which, which should be the focus uh, of our discipleship. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm just going to read this again in your hearing, and those of you that have been a part or in receipt of uh, the messages we've brought so far, you know where I'm going with this. Um, Paul says in the 14th verse, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, the context of this lesson is that we might know how to behave ourselves in the house of God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. Now, when we think about behaving ourselves, I, I know, don't know about you, but I, I suspect you're just like me. When somebody says, I'm going to tell you how you need to behave, the first thing I start looking for is a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts that uh, they're going to uh, help me understand how to put uh, uh, barriers, if you will, on, on my behavior by which I will be judged. Behavior carries with it oftentimes, if we don't look at it in its proper context, a negative tone. Um, as children, we talk about our children behaving all of the time, which is truly uh, uh, conducting themselves in a, in a manner in which is pleasing to those that have set behavior before them. But here Paul is talking about behaving ourselves in the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And he's not listing a bunch of rules in, that are in front of us or do's and don'ts. He's using the person of Jesus Christ, God himself coming into the realm of creation, being manifest in the flesh. And our view of Jesus Christ is that which should, uh, you, we should use as our, uh, as, as our rudder um, and behave ourselves in the church and in the experience of our life lives based upon our view of Jesus. And that's what Paul's after here. That's why he, he lists so many things uh, relative to uh, giving illustration and description of the person of Jesus Christ. And this morning, if God would bless, we're going to look at being justified, Christ being justified in the spirit. We've dealt already with uh, uh, the church and the, the blessing of the church, that we, we are uh, members of the church, and we sang the song this morning that, uh, that we are, we're marching to Zion, that we've left Sinai behind. The place where uh, that burned with judgment, that had those rules and those regulations. You see, the church is not uh, given unto us today uh, as it is in the New Testament church uh, that we would have a, a, a laundry list of do's and don'ts. We are set at liberty in Christ Jesus, that we have freedom of movement. 
And then we have the indwelling of the Spirit of God uh, to govern us and to guide us. And, and our view of Jesus Christ, uh, when we give consideration to uh, him in his ministry, we even going back before that, when we see him in his deity, that he is the living word uh, that spoke this very world into existence, when we give consideration to the person of Christ, and then today when we consider the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that we understand uh, that what Jesus has done is done forever. And it needs no uh, enhancement, if you will. Our view of Christ is very important uh, to govern how it is that we behave in the walk of our life. Now, we are, uh, we are in, in Zion. We're not in Sinai. The church has uh, its beauty. It's the pillar, and it's the ground of truth. It's a place of security. It's a place of, of great joy. And it is the place uh, that showcases and uh, illustrates the person of Jesus better than anywhere else. Now, I love this time of the year, spring excuse me, springtime, uh, time of Easter, uh, time of seemingly new beginnings, uh, where you look out and in my backyard, it wasn't long ago that it just was a bunch of dirt and, and things, the sticks uh, growing up out of the ground, and all of a sudden they spring forth uh, with beautiful life and color, uh, seemingly as though there's life coming uh, from that which was certainly dormant, but it even had the appearance of being dead. We're surrounded by uh, the, the doctrine of the resurrection, even in creation. And I love this time of the year uh, because of that very thing. There's, there is a, a, a newness that comes uh, from that. And I would tell you that the church of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, is not a place of, of, of burden and doldrum and do's and don'ts. It's a place of liberty that we should celebrate, that we should rejoice uh, one with another uh, relative uh, to the blessings that we have in our lives and the mercy that's bestowed upon us, uh, that we would look back repeatedly and see God's hand outstretched before us. Paul is saying how you look at Christ will bless you to understand the blessings of being uh, in the church while you live here uh, serving God. He says, uh, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. We're not going to go back over that, but suffice it to say uh, that Christ came as a mighty warrior Christ came as one that, that uh, he, had, he had purpose in his, in his coming, that he would destroy the very works of the devil, and he would uh, remove the sin uh, that was charged to us uh, in Adam uh, when Adam sinned in the garden. Christ came to triumphantly remove sin from the elect family of God, and he also came to destroy the very works of the devil. And I would tell you this morning uh, that uh, he is yet working uh, through the Spirit in our lives uh, that we can rise above of those things that trouble us and draw us in uh, to identifying ourselves in our carnality. But this is what I want this morning. I spent more time with that than I wanted to, but this is what I want. He's justified in the Spirit. Now, justification is a proclamation of righteousness. That's what justification is. It's a proclamation of righteousness. It is a legal term. It is something that uh, uh, removes all doubt uh, relative to the facts that are uh, presented. And justification, and I would tell you uh, this morning, the Apostle Paul in the Roman letter uh, speaks of our being justified freely through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus uh, through and by his shed blood upon Calvary. That we stand just and holy uh, before a righteous God uh, through the work of Jesus Christ. But Christ himself, when he was here in the world, uh, he was justified in the Spirit, not by the Spirit, in the Spirit. And there, there's a, a, a distinction uh, that we're going to try to make uh, in that uh, this morning. That we would recognize, uh, and this is so important, that, that we understand, and we'll look here just momentarily, uh, of the person of the Spirit, that the Spirit of God is God. Just as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, uh, is God, manifest in the flesh, the Spirit is God. God the Spirit is not uh, the, the weakest link in the Godhead. Uh, the Spirit is equal uh, to the Father and to the Son. And to understand that the Spirit that was working in Christ when he was here in his ministry performing the, the multitude of miracles, I believe I, I counted them in Scripture, and uh, he performed a minimum of 40 miracles in his three and a half year ministry, and they were in and through the working of the Spirit. And that we would recognize this morning that that same Spirit dwells within the child of God. 
That when, as we look uh, uh, to the things of the Spirit and identify with them uh, in our lives, when we crucify the old man and his deeds, when we turn off the switch of carnality and covetousness and the things that are appealing uh, mostly to our flesh and identify with the things of the Spirit uh, that are identified over in Galatians uh, chapter 5, uh, the love and the, the, the faithfulness and the forgiveness and, and the brotherly kindness and those kinds of things, that Spirit working in us is the same spirit uh, that justified Christ while he was here. It's not the weakest link in, in the Godhead. I will tell you this morning, if it's not for the Spirit, uh, we don't have anything to look to in our experience today relative to the person of Jesus Christ. We're here celebrating and we discuss uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that we would understand it is through and by the Spirit of God recorded in the Roman letter by which he was resurrected. It's that same spirit uh, that, that will work uh, in us, that is working in us, and it's the same spirit by which we will come forth. We'll, we'll prove that to you here momentarily. Justified in the spirit. Let's go with, uh, go with me to Isaiah chapter 40. And I want to look very briefly to, um, to things that Scripture says about uh, the spirit uh, and I'm going to go to a couple of places this morning. I'm going to have to, to hasten with it. I'll try to go there slow enough that you can follow me and at least mark it in your Bible for a future study. But in Isaiah chapter 40, this is hundreds of years prior to the church uh, being established uh, uh, by Jesus Christ on the day, uh, the Spirit of God on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the, the, the church that was established uh, and Christ uh, ministered unto while he was here in his ministry, Isaiah is prophesying hundreds of years prior to that. And he's, what he does is he calls out and showcases the Godhead in the church. Listen to what he says. I'm going to bounce through a couple of these verses. He says in the first verse, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. He's talking about the Father, God the Father. Saith your God, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now I would tell you this morning, that ought to be good news to God's people. That we, uh, we have words of comfort. The church is not uh, to bring condemnation uh, unto God's people. The church is to speak words of comfort. The language that's used here uh, really is, is uh, relative to speaking to the heart. You know, I can't speak to your heart. I can speak audibly, uh, but if the Lord blesses, you will hear those words, and you'll hear them not only with your natural ear, but you'll hear them with your spiritual understanding. As Brother Tim prayed that God would anoint the words coming forth, uh, but that also he would anoint the receptacle of those words uh, that you would hear in the Spirit. Uh, when you hear a, a message uh, coming from a, uh, one of the, uh, a God's pulpits uh, in the church today and it falls on good ground um, and it causes you to, uh, to feel compelled uh, to serve God better tomorrow than you have today, uh, that's not because a man was articulate and, and able to set something before you in a, a logical way. It's because you heard uh, in your heart of understanding. You heard with ears that can hear. And that's really what the church is all about, that we would speak words comfortably unto Jerusalem. And here's the authorized message. You have received of the Lord's hand double for all of your iniquity and for your sins. Double. That's heaping over, if you will. That is, not only have you received grace, which is God's riches at Christ's expense, not only have you received uh, a something uh, that you did not merit in and of yourself, uh, that you've also received mercy. God gives you something that you didn't deserve, and he withholds that which you did deserve. I'll tell you, uh, the longer I live in my life, uh, uh, and the more I look back at the mistakes I've made, I can see God's merciful hand uh, in my life. He has withheld a judgment and chastisement, um, uh, certainly from what he could. He could have uh, in, in my experience. And the longer I live, uh, I'm thankful for grace. If we don't have grace, we don't have anything else. But I'm, the more I live, the more I'm thankful for mercy, that God withholds that which I deserve, knowing that uh, in and of myself, I can do nothing uh, in his service and that my tendency is to identify with my carnal nature uh, instead of my spiritual nature. And God in his long suffering and in his mercy, he continues to lead and guide uh, and direct. And the church uh, plays a very important role in that. 
So the Father is at work uh, uh, authorizing the message of grace and mercy unto his people. And then in the fifth verse, it says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. He's talking about Christ, uh, that God abounded toward us in all wisdom and in prudence in the person of Jesus Christ. That God was manifest in the flesh, uh, that God condescended from heaven into this low ground of sin and sorrow in the person of Jesus Christ. uh, And he dwelt among his creation, even though they received him not, uh, Christ dwelt here um, and and went to Calvary because he was set as a flint. Um, He was looking to the joy that was set before. Him And he endured the cross. Uh, here we have the glory of God uh, coming in the very realm uh, of creation. And, and, uh, and, he, and he spoke those things uh, which God would have us to consider even yet in the church today. He says in the ninth verse, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up in the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up. And be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. That single verse gives you a a, a definition of what the purpose of the church is all about. That we would come up out of this time world. You know, sometimes you go through things in, in life and you, you just find yourself uh, wallowing around in the mully grubs and the, the disappointments of life, even if things are going okay. Uh, you look around and you see so many people uh, that are hurting and so many people that are, are behaving in an ungodly manner and things that, that come upon you in the experience of your life and it, and it rocks you to your very core. I'll tell you the message of the church is that we would come up out of that. Come into a place, come into a location uh, where God has promised uh, to, uh, to uh, have fellowship with you and lift you above uh, those things, that you would set your eyes upon the goodness and the mercy of God. You know, uh, in my experience, I've been uh, in circumstance, I've not suffered very much in my life, I will tell you um, and, and confess that to you. I really uh, have not. Um, there have been times I've behaved as though I've suffered a lot. Um, and my wife will tell you, I get in the mully grubs just like anybody else. Uh, But when I really look at it, I haven't suffered uh, very much in my life. Uh, But I look around and I see people uh, that are suffering. uh, uh, And and, and a lot of it has nothing to do uh, with their behavior. It's circumstance uh, in their life. And it causes me to want to point them to the Lord. Because therein lies, uh, therein lies courage, therein lies uh, the ability to, to rise above and put things in a perspective uh, that you can deal with them and, that, and it not rock you to the very uh, uh, depth of your, of your soul. There's a lot of God's people today that, that are bitter because of life circumstance and you wonder why, well, why do good things happen uh, to bad people? Well, you can go back to uh, the Garden of Eden and you can see where Adam sinned uh, uh, as he partook of the fruit and that's why uh, uh, bad things happen to good people. That's why it happens. It's not, a lot of times it's not uh, because of things that we have done. You know, the apostles uh, uh, dealt with that with Jesus. That uh, at a time there was a there was even a child that was uh, that was born blind and they came to the Savior and they said, uh, well, who sinned the, the child or his mom or his dad uh, that this child was born blind? And Christ answered the question. None of them. It's not based upon their behavior. It's based upon the very presence of sin. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we talked uh, about the works of the devil and God's hatred uh, for sin. And I wonder sometimes if I hate sin as bad or as much as God hates sin. You know, I've, I'm convinced if I did, I would strive to sin less in my life. I wouldn't have to look back and pray for forgiveness. I'd be praying for God's hand uh, stretched before me uh, that I would sin not in my life. That's what John uh, uh, spoke of in 1 John, uh, that we would uh, endeavor to rise above. And children, I write these things unto you that you sin not. But if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Sometimes we lean upon the second part of that verse uh, far too much. We say, well, you know, Jesus Christ is the advocate. He'll show the blood to God. Um, I can go ahead and just sin and live any way I want to. It's satisfying uh, to the flesh. I can, I can disregard the things of the Lord, even though it, it touches my heart. I can set all that aside because Christ will forgive me uh, after all. Now, triumphantly, he will. Once you're forgiven, you're forgiven forever. But I'll tell you, there's, there's a hell here on earth. And I would have us to know that 
this morning that God has set it before us uh, that we would be able uh, to, uh, to live our lives, the abundant life to the glory and honor of the Lord and everything else in our life becomes better when we're walking with the Savior. And that's the point of the message. Here we find that Jesus comes, uh, uh, God manifests in the flesh, and I want to slide down here and, and move on. He says in the 10th verse, uh, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule uh, for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Do you realize that when Christ came into the world, uh, he had joy set before him at every moment of the time he was here? And it wasn't that ultimately he would be delivered um, um, out of the grave. Uh, that was part of it, but that wasn't what his focus was. His focus was you. His focus was his people. The Lord's portion is his people. And Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. That Jesus Christ has an inheritance and it's his people. Paul wrote in the Hebrew letter that he endured the cross, despising the shame. Why? For the joy that was set before him. That's you. What do we endure in our lives today? How do we endure things in our life today? Do we endure things uh, with our teeth gritted and uh, why me, Lord? Uh, everybody else is just kind of going along. They're being blessed and, and here I am. I'm, just, it, from, I'm going from one problem to the next. Or do we endure things looking and depending upon uh, the mercy and the grace and the, the presence of God uh, in our lives? You know, it's not so much uh, about the things that come upon us. It's how we deal with them and the perspective that we have of them in our lives. And, and I would tell you this morning, and I said it earlier, I haven't suffered much in my life and I'm not looking to. <laughs> I will tell you right now, if, if there's suffering uh, that's coming in my life, I pray that God's hand will be stretched before me and that I will be able to, by faith, uh, look to the biblical principle of sufferings and glory uh, that is carried throughout all of scripture, uh, that as you suffer, there will be glory. And you don't have to wait for the resurrection to get the glory. The glory is in the felt presence of the Lord that as he has, he blesses you to endure the problem at hand. He blesses you with his felt presence uh, that you would go through the trial and the trouble and that your faith would be strengthened and encouraged. Oftentimes we endure things and, and, and we, look, uh, we look at the circumstance and we wonder, what have I done that has brought this upon me? And most of the time, it's not about what you've done. <laughs> it's about the circumstance. And that God is blessing you with an opportunity uh, to serve him stronger and better uh, in your life. These are hard things to do uh, when, when the trouble is, is uh, bearing down upon us. This, I want to move with this. He, he goes on, and this is what I really want in this 40th chapter. Talking about the Spirit. But I want you to, I want you to consider the God that we're, we're talking about this morning. It says, he shall feed, in the 11th verse, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meted out heaven with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? This is the God that we're here to worship this morning. That, uh, that uh, he is, he's the God, he owns the cattle of a thousand hills, he, is, he owns all the gold of Ophir, um, he speaks and it's done, commands and it stands fast, and uh, none can ask him what doest thou or why you do it. This is the God of the Bible, that in the, in the span of, he measures the waters in the hollow of his hand. Behold your God. You know, the church is that which repeatedly should show forth the greatness, the glory, the power, and the love of God. That's why we come. You didn't come here this morning to hear uh, me tell you how you need to live your life. You came here, I trust, this morning uh, for me to, uh, to get out of the way and show you a man that has told you all things, uh, the person of Jesus Christ, uh, that as he uh, uh, ripped the veil uh, from top to bottom uh, when, when he died upon Calvary, that we would have access and see inside the Holy of Holies, uh, that that's why we come this morning, to hear good news from home. He says, who had directed the Spirit of the Lord? Now, you've got the Father in the authorized message, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. You've got the Son as God a coming in His glory in the person of Christ. And now you've got the Spirit who had directed the Spirit of the Lord or being His counselor had taught Him. The Spirit is not a lesser person in the Godhead. 
The Spirit is, is, uh, is the th- one of the three in one God, the Trinity. You say, well, explain that to me. I just did, to the best of my ability. I can't expound upon it any more than that. And you believe that not by man's explanation. You believe it by faith. That there is three in one, and each one, the Father has His work, the Son has His work, and the Spirit has His work. And these three agree in one. And there's a record, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three agree in one. And here's the record, that God has given unto you eternal life, and that life is in His Son. That's the record. That's what the the Godhead bears a faithful witness to uh, in heaven this morning. So who's directed the Spirit? There's none that could direct the Spirit. There's none that can direct the Spirit today. There are folks that would say, well, I can turn the Spirit on. I can turn the Spirit off. I just got to get in the Spirit. I haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to just muster up the Spirit in my experience. It doesn't work that way. And the Spirit is not on a a, a yo-yo, if you will, from heaven. That's not how God works. You see, the Spirit is truth. The Spirit brings clarity. The Spirit brings understanding. And when we live our lives of discipleship, as we endeavor to live our lives, you know what we really pursue in our lives is peace and contentment. That's really all I want is to be at peace and, ha- and be content uh, in my life. I'm not looking for man's riches. Uh, I want to be content with what I have, that I can serve God uh, as I serve His people. And in and, and doing so, uh, the Lord can bless you to be fully content with very little according to man's measures. And and what's important in our lives is is living our life in peace and joy and contentment. I'll tell you, when you you, uh, understand that godliness with contentment is great gain, now you can live your life and the things that you encounter in life, the things that the Lord blesses you to have, whether they be uh, spiritual or whether they be material. And yes, I believe God blesses with material uh, blessings. He'll do so when He's convinced and He knows you'll use Him in His service. You can live your life and the things that come your way, all of a sudden, you look at them differently. Covetousness does not uh, uh, align itself with what you have. I'll tell you, there's a lot of people in 2008 uh, that were covetous about uh, the money that they had in the bank. And when it went away, it ruined the lives of many uh, people because their attitude uh, toward what they had uh, was placed in the wrong way. Uh, that we would understand that having the Spirit dwelling uh, with us, uh, being truth and clarity and understanding uh, that, that we can possibly uh, be able to even see around corners from time to time, uh, uh, not knowing what tomorrow brings, but knowing who holds tomorrow in His hand. That we can trust the heart of God when we can't see His hand before us. You know, that takes faith. And the church is that, that's the message that comes uh, from the church. Go with me to Isaiah uh, chapter 61. And again, this is, this is in a prophetic sense. Uh, here we find Isaiah in chapter 61 uh, prophesying of the person of Jesus Christ uh, and what it was that he would do uh, when he came uh, in his ministry. Remember the text that's, that we're after this morning, that he was justified in the Spirit. That the Spirit of God uh, was in the person of Jesus Christ uh, and and through uh, the work of the Spirit, uh, many things happen in in the ministry of Christ uh, to the building up of the church uh, that even exists to this very day. I trust this morning. Here, listen to what Isaiah says. First verse, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. This is prophetic of Jesus Christ, uh, the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. What's the message in the church? Good tidings. You came here this morning, I trust to hear a good news from home, to be encouraged and strengthened. I apologize uh, much of the time for my delivery. I get a little bit excited about it, a little bit urgent, uh, maybe raise my voice a little bit, and that goes, uh, just in doing so, you may think I'm, I'm, I'm barking at you, and that's not my intent. I'll tell you, the message of the gospel, the good news of the gospel uh, should uh, compel us and should excite us. It's good news. It's good tidings. Good tidings of great joy. 
You know, during the time of the year that we celebrated the birth of the Savior, uh, we, we sing Christmas uh, hymns uh, along those lines, uh, that there's good tidings of great joy in the person of Jesus Christ. Well, I would have you to know this morning uh, that as we're here considering the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, from the dead, that is good tidings from home. That should, that should warm your very heart. That should cause you to, to rejoice. That should bring joy uh, in your experience. That's, one of, that's the purpose of the church. Well, Christ came that he would preach those good tidings. Listen to what he says. He says, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Hold on to that anointed for a minute. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You know, the message of the gospel will bind the brokenhearted. If you're brokenhearted today for one reason or another, the, the good news of the gospel by its very design as it is delivered uh, and, uh, by the Spirit of God will bind up the brokenhearted. It'll help heal uh, some of those, those wounds that we have uh, in our lives. He says, to proclaim liberty. This is not captivity as, as uh, Sinai was, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. When we consider the message of the gospel, and when, first of all, when you consider the person of Jesus Christ, uh, who is uh, the antitype, if you will, of the law, the law brought everything to Christ. Now, under the law, there was provision that pointed to Christ, it was called the year of Jubilee, uh, that under the law, um, every seven years, that there would be a, an occasion and an opportunity uh, to, uh, to uh, free yourself from captivity. If you had sold yourself uh, into bondage, if you had sold yourself into captivity uh, uh, for one reason or another, there was provision under the law that you would be able to redeem uh, yourself out of that condition. That was a type of what Christ did. Now, this happened all of the time under the law. And, and certainly the year of Jubilee is one that uh, was good news back to those that were under the law, especially and specifically to those that were in captivity. Can you imagine six and a half years and you're under captivity and you know that the year of Jubilee is coming and you're soon to be freed from captivity. Do you think that's going to uh, excite you? That is, is that going to uh, compel you to, uh, to perhaps live differently uh, than, uh, than you were that got you into captivity? I would have you to understand this. That Jesus Christ came and he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He, had, he has performed and ushered in the year of Jubilee for the uh, triumphant and last time. That we are captives, we are captives of sin, but Christ has conquered death, hell, and the grave. Every day is the year of Jubilee in the child of God's experience because of the work of Jesus Christ. Well, Christ came to proclaim that. The message of the church today is the year of Jubilee. We operate in liberty, not captivity. He says, the, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. The church is given to us. And remember the context back in Timothy is that we would know how to behave ourselves in the church. The, our view of Christ helps us understand uh, our, our, our position in the church, the function of the church, why God even put it here. And in so doing, it helps us behave ourselves in recognition of the person of Jesus Christ. The church is not to remind us of our failures and our shortcomings. I, got, I, I don't need anybody to remind me of those. Those are before me all of the time. As a matter of fact, when somebody reminds me of my shortcoming, I typically don't receive that very well. That's not something that I welcome uh, at, at all. As a matter of fact, if you get hidden down a path of, of showing me my shortcoming, I'm likely going to interrupt you, change the subject, turn my attention elsewhere. Because our, our carnal nature is, well, if you think that about me, let me tell you what I think about you. And, and we all know how that goes. 
The church, the message of the church is not to bring to our remembrance of our shortcomings. The church is designed to show us how Christ has blessed us to overcome them through his finished work. That we would look, we would understand that, that through Christ I can do all things because it's him that strengthens me. I can do all things. Now that doesn't mean you get to just do anything you want. The context there um, is that a Christ is authorizing the all things. That you can do all things that are pleasing unto him. Well, in order for you to do things that are pleasing unto him, you've got to be acquainted with what is pleasing unto him. That's a function of the church. He says that he might be glorified. Now, at the beginning of this, the Isaiah says that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. Let's see where the anointing takes place. Matthew chapter 3. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 3, very familiar place in Scripture, where we find the setting that John the Baptist is at the River Jordan, and he is a baptizing of believers unto repentance. He's also ushering in of the coming of the Messiah. He is, he is the one that is crying in the wilderness, recorded back in Isaiah chapter 40. Uh, he is the one that is, uh, is uh, showcasing uh, the coming of Jesus Christ. So here's John. He's on, the, he's on the River Jordan, and he's baptizing people. And here comes in the 13th verse... Well, let's, let's read the 11th just to get a little bit more of the context. I indeed baptize you, John the Baptist, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You see, uh, Christ was justified in the Spirit, not by the Spirit as two uh, separate entities, the Spirit standing by the side of, and, and, and blessing of that Spirit was dwelling within. He was justified in the Spirit. And John the Baptist is saying, there's one coming that I'm not even worthy to unloose his, his, the latches on his shoes, which is a, 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 a biblical a picture of redemption. He says, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the shaft and unqu with unquenchable fire. Listen to this. Now, then come a Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me. Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. When Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, and who I am well pleased. Now right here in Scripture, you've got the Trinity present uh, yet again. You have Isaiah prophesying uh, relative to the church of the Trinity, the authorized message, the person of Jesus Christ, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit uh, in the church. And right here, you've got a Christ being baptized into his church uh, that is showing forth its right to do so. Suffer it to be so, John, for it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. All Christ is saying there, this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do. You know, I, I really do try, contrary to some popular opinion, I really do try to do the right thing all the time. The problem I have is that I, uh, the, the way I look at things, I let things get in the way and my, my judgment uh, is, is impaired sometimes. I would tell you uh, that a proper view of Christ will help you and it will help me uh, with uh, 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 not being as impaired as I look at things passing and making judgments. That I won't make as many mistakes. And Lord knows I've made plenty of them. And, and they, they break my heart. I was away from the church for years. And it was wasted time. And it breaks my heart knowing that, that, that I did that. But it causes me to rejoice in the long suffering and the mercy of God that he saw fit. He loved me enough to pick me up and, and hit me alongside of the head and so that I would not stay in that condition. And by God's mercy, I listened to it. He put, he put someone in my life that, that helped my judgment. Here we, we have Christ 
is, is telling John, this is the right thing to do. You know what happens when you do the right thing? There is a threefold witness that takes place when you've done the right thing. Doesn't it feel good when you've done the right thing? I'll tell you, it feels great. It ought not to surprise us when we do the right thing. But it feels really good when you do, when you sacrifice of yourself, or when, you, when you step beyond yourself, when you take the eyes off of, of self and you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Well, this occasion, Jesus did the right thing. And what we find here is God, the Trinity, coming down in such a way that it was undeniable that it was the right thing to do. And it, it also proclaimed beyond a shadow of a doubt of who this person was that came unto John the Baptist to be baptized uh, to him. That was the function, one of the primary functions of the Spirit of, in, in the ministry of Christ, uh, that it would showcase and illustrate that this really is the Messiah. You know, there were very few that believed that it was really Jesus, the Messiah, that had come. The Jewish religion... All of the hierarchy in the Jewish religion that uh, for years and years and hundreds of years uh, said he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. We know he's coming. He came. They were blinded to it. They thought he was an imposter. Uh, they said crucify him. He's going to disrupt our way of life. There's people in the world today that want to be called by the name of Jesus Christ, but they want to wear their own apparel and eat their own bread. I want to be called by the name of Christ, but I'm going to do it my way, not his way. It doesn't work that way. Here we have in this setting, Christ doing the right thing, and the Trinity comes present in, in the, the spirit descends in the form of a dove. If you don't think it was a dove, you know, doves are really neat. We have a couple of them uh, at our home uh, here in, in Livermore. We had some also, uh, I, I think it was Mountain House that we had. Uh, doves are, are interesting uh, and, and they're, they're docile and, and they're pleasant to look upon. You got to be careful because some of them look like pigeons and that's totally different altogether. I remember Sister Lura, she was in the hospital at one point, and there was a dove that came on the windowsill of the hospital. And all she talked about that, as long as you'd listen to her, she'd tell you about that dove. Just in case you think that this was just some image, if you will, if you go over to Luke chapter 3, and I'm not going to go there, Luke chapter 3 says the Holy Ghost descending in the bodily shape like a dove. You know what came from heaven? A dove. A dove came and sat upon the Savior. The spirit in that form. And then heavens being open, a voice proclaimed. I'll tell you, just think about that. It gives me shivers just to think the voice of God. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Has God ever spoken to you with the touch of his hand upon you? And blessed you to know that he's pleased with you? Blessed you to know that I know what you're going through, but I'm here. I'm with you. Be not afraid. Be still, my soul. The Lord is, is on my side. You know, we pray for people that are going through hard times. I pray for Brother Leroy all the time, a soldier of the cross who's dedicated his life to the cause of Christ. And, and sin that's present in the world has racked his body and his mind and robbed him of so much in his life. And my prayer is that the Spirit of God would just abide continually with him and say, be still, my soul. I'm on your side. Even when you can't connect cognitive thought, God's arm is not ever shortened, church. It doesn't matter. It does matter what you're going through, but it makes no difference in what you're going through. God's arm is never shortened. We find here in this, in this circumstance that the divine communication comes from, from heaven itself. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John uh, chapter 1. I want to get uh, this and uh, I pray the Lord a whole time for just a minute. John chapter 1. <clears throat> if I can find it very quickly. And uh, in, the, in the first chapter, we find the same setting in the 32nd verse, John 1 and 32. And John bare record. That's a very important statement that John is making. This is not John the Baptist. This is the, uh, this is the uh, uh, Apostle John that's looking back at the account of John the Baptist baptizing the Savior. And John bare record. How do you do that? By the Spirit. 
The Spirit anointed him. The Spirit inspired him uh, to pen this. John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, behold, the Lamb of God. You know what the presence of the Spirit uh, did in this situation? It, it caused John uh, to proclaim a record uh, that was undeniably true. Did you know what the Spirit uh, that dwells within you does today? The exact same thing. The exact same thing. The Spirit that dwells in your heart blesses you to proclaim that a Jesus Christ is Lord. He is your Savior. He's your priest, your King. He's your all in all. You cannot say that uh, with a heart of understanding and a clear mind outside of the Spirit of God. Go read in 1 Corinthians. No man calleth Jesus a curse uh, if the Spirit of God is dwelling in him. Not only that, you cannot proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord outside of the Spirit of God. What's that mean? Why does that have any value? Well, I'll tell you, if you're you're here this morning, uh, I trust, you're here to hear good news from home. You're here to consider the, the person of Jesus Christ. It's important enough to you that you set aside a perfectly good Sunday morning from doing something that your flesh would want to do, to come in here and listen to somebody uh, bark at you for an hour, hopefully for only an hour, about this person, Jesus Christ. Why did you do that? Because the Spirit compels you. And if the Spirit dwells within you, then heaven is your home. You have a hope that resides within your very heart and your soul. And the Spirit is bearing witness with your spirit. What? That you're a child of God. That's the point. Just of being justified in the Spirit. The thing that the Spirit did in Christ in His ministry was repeatedly uh, proclaim as as He uh, was blessed to do the miracles, as the account of Christ in His baptism, the the account in His birth, the account in His death, the account in His resurrection, uh, the presence of the Spirit said, this is Him. This is Him. It's really Him. What have you to understand this morning? That what think ye of Christ... Whose son is he is probably the most important question you will ever ask yourself. Your answer to that question will align your behavior in the house of God, the church. The church being how it is you serve God, your discipleship. You know, a lot of times we we get the idea, well, uh, anytime a preacher says church, that means Golden Gate Primitive Baptist Church. Well, right now, I'm pretty happy looking out here this morning. You're here. I'm glad you're here. I want you to come back every single Sunday uh, because it's wonderful having you here. But when the Bible speaks of the church, uh, it's talking about uh, uh, multiple things. And in this situation, he's talking about your life of discipleship, uh, you being the church. You coming here this morning does not make you the church. You're the church every day. You don't ever stop being the church. This is the church met together. And I'm thankful for it. He says, uh, here in in John, he says, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. And again the next day after John stood and the two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. You know what? Understanding... uh, what what is truth, the truth about Jesus Christ will do for you, it'll cause you to want to manifest it in your life. You'll look for opportunity to tell somebody else about it. That's biblical evangelism. That's not standing on a street corner trying to uh, proselyte and and get people to do things that they don't want to do. Uh, you, You will have opportunity and you'll be ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within you in meekness and fear when the question comes. Instead of uh, when somebody says, hey, uh, I hope you have a, or you ask me how you doing, I'm having a blessed day. Well, that should give you an opportunity right there. There's somebody that, that understands something about blessing. And that should cause you uh, to rejoice in that. That if you're not being asked these things in your life, then give consideration. 
to how it is that you, you live your life to the glory and the honor of the Lord. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. I'm going to go to two more places, and then I'm going to quit. I don't know how long I'll be at either one of them. Romans chapter 1, carrying this thought forward. Third verse, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh. That's important. He was made of the seed of David. We didn't cover that uh, uh, God manifest in the flesh, but uh, that Christ was a descendant of David. He had a right uh, to the throne of David. Uh, he didn't have the sinful nature of David. He didn't have the sinful blood of David. The Holy Spirit uh, conceived uh, uh, with the virgin and not in a cooperative sense, overshadowed her. But nevertheless, we'll move on from that. And, and this is what I want. And declared to be the Son of God with power. How? According to the Spirit of holiness. Christ was declared repeatedly to be the Son of God with power, being justified in the Spirit. But in this case, Paul points to one particular event. We've already covered the baptism of Christ. You could go back and spend time on the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, the 40 miracles uh, that Christ performed uh, uh, in, through the Spirit of God, in the Spirit of God. But Paul points to this, and this is where I trust uh, we, we tie this message into the celebration of today. According to the Spirit of holiness, how? By the resurrection from the dead. By the resurrection from the dead. Go with me very quickly to Romans chapter 8 in the 11th verse. And this is where we'll close this morning. The Apostle Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans is speaking highly, if not exclusively, positional. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He's not talking about getting into Christ Jesus based upon how it is you walk. He's talking about being in the Spirit, uh, and your manner of walk is the Spirit, not according to the flesh. Your walk is in the Spirit. It's the manner of walk. You, you, uh, you are blessed in your life uh, to give consideration and to rejoice at the presence of the Spirit, uh, to, to cling to the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit dwells within you. You don't do it in order to bring the Spirit. Why do we sin? We don't sin to become sinners. We sin because we are sinners. Why do we approach the things of God? Why do we give consideration uh, to the love of God? Because God first loved us, put his love within us, and we are compelled to let brotherly love continue. We don't, re we don't reach out and grab these things and bring them in in order that they have a presence. Uh, they have a presence by the grace of God. And we look to spiritual things because of the indwelling of the Spirit. Paul is dealing with positional, uh, uh, the positional nature of the child of God. And he says this in the 11th verse. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. You see, the spirit, the same spirit that justified Christ dwells within the child of God. Not only so, the seed which is Christ dwells within the child of God. Uh, there is something that dwells within the child of God uh, that is sinless, that is perfectly obedient unto the Father as Christ was while he was here in his ministry, and that is fit for glory land. Paul deals with that uh, as he goes on in this uh, eighth chapter, uh, and, and in about another hour we'll cover it. But the creature, the new creature created within, uh, longs to be back with God who gave it, to be delivered from the bondage of this corruption. Your, your new creature, your spirit given unto you by God has a longing to go back home. That's your hope. And that's why hope's not a wish. That which drives you in your life, the hope that you have, that causes you to consider that a time is a, is, is a temporary thing, that the trouble that I'm going through, it'll pass, uh, that ultimately I'll be delivered from even the very presence of sin uh, in a triumphant way. Uh, those thoughts, those feelings, uh, is, it, it, they're internal within you. And truly, they're, uh, they're intrinsic to your nature. Because you have a dual nature. 
Now, your, car, your carnality doesn't want to hear any of that. Your carnality cares only about when is this guy going to quit talking. I want to go next door. I saw some of the food over there. It's enough. Our carnality looks at things that way. Our spiritual nature just wants to bask in the glory of the Lord. Just wants to sit down in the finished work of Jesus Christ and then get up, get up and about the master's business. He says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, that's biblical proof that the spirit raised Christ from the dead. If that spirit dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we're not debtors. We are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And I close with these two verses this morning. If that Spirit, the Spirit of God that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, that same Spirit dwells in you, and it's that same Spirit that will raise you you know, we, we look out in the springtime, we look out at a field, and it's, it looks barren. Or we look at a, a grove of trees, and they look dead. Like somebody ought to go cut them down and make firewood out of them. And then all of a sudden, life springs forth out of what is seemingly, seemingly dead. That doesn't mean that life came from an external sense. That life dwelt within. Dwelt within. That spirit dwells within the child of grace. I'll tell you, <clears throat> I like to have a mixture in my yard of things that stay green all the time. I don't want just a bunch of sticks for four or five months. It's great when they come back, but I want a mixture of, of that. I look at, at my life as a child of God and, and my discipleship, and I've looked like a dead stick more than I'm comfortable with. I truly have. I'd like to live my life in such a way that there's tree, there's leaves, and there's fruit. You know, we, there's 12 manner of fruit that descends from the very throne of God, the tree of life. And it's for the healing of the nations. It is an opportunity for us to be fruit bearers year round, all the time. We don't have to wait until it's in season. <laughs> Scripture says we should be in season and out of season, that we should be consistent regardless of the circumstance in our lives. He says this in the 16th and 17th verses. The Spirit, the same Spirit that, that justified Christ in His ministry and all of the things that we've tried to talk to you about, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit is truth. The Spirit will never lie to you. The Spirit bears a witness with you when, in, in your experience as that Spirit dwelling in you that you're a child of the King. That heaven's your home. That you've got nothing to fear in your life. It doesn't diminish the trouble that we have. It changes how we look at the trouble that we have. It should. It'll cause us to cling to one another in times of trouble. Because God's blessed us with a great cloud of witness. God's blessed us with each other to help us bear one another's burdens. I'm so thankful for the people in my life that have, that have helped me and have lifted me up in, in a time when, when I was in, in great need. They took me in. They, they, they helped me. Not, that, not because I could help them in return. They helped me because it was the right thing to do because the Spirit was telling them, this is right. That's living a life of Christianity. He says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. You know, the biblical principle of suffering and glory is taught all through Scripture. We're going to suffer in this life. 
And it's not necessarily tied to your behavior. It can be. God's chastening rod sometimes is a grievous thing. But much of the time, I would say most of the time, when we suffer in our lives, it's because we live in a fallen world and we're compassed about by the, the sin that's in the world that ultimately God is going to deliver us from. He, deliver us, he delivers us in it and through it. He's, he's delivered us from the penalty of it already through the blood of Jesus Christ. But we suffer in this life from time to time. Things don't always go like we want them to. By the way, that's not necessarily a, a biblical definition of suffering just because you don't get your way. I behave that way sometimes, but it's not necessarily the case. True suffering is, is that, that that we've seen and perhaps even some of you are going through it. But it would have you to understand that the spirit of God that dwells within you stands at the ready to bless you to get, put your eye on glory instead of your eye on suffering. And in so doing, you'll be able to endure the suffering and yet maintain your integrity and honor and glorify God as you're doing so. And I will tell you, over in the Corinthian letter, and it's often misquoted, people will say, well, God's not going to put on you any more than you can handle. The Bible doesn't teach that, by the way. That's not biblical. But what the letter says in the Corinthian letter is that regardless of the temptation, the trial, the trouble that you're going through, God will make a way of escape. And I will tell you this morning, the way of escape is the person of Jesus Christ. That's how you get through the, the trouble and the trial uh, in your life. Here we find Paul making the point, and he says this. I, I'll read the 18th verse, and then I really will stop. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings that we're going through in life, even though they seem, they seem real, very real, and they're hard to deal with much of the time. And a lot of times they come upon us and we had nothing to do with it. We didn't bring it on ourselves, and yet it's true suffering. I would submit to you that tapping the spirit of God that dwells within you will, will elevate the glory which shall be revealed in you at some point in time in your life or as you get to glory. And God will bless you to focus on that. And everything else seems to fall in line. You turn your attention and all of a sudden things seem to, to move in a much better way. Serving God is not done that, that we might obligate him. Serving God is that we acknowledge him in our lives and we depend upon him and lean upon him day by day. Trust we said something that would stir your pure mind. God would add his grace in the preaching of his word. We publish an open door to the church this morning. If it's your desire to unite, we encourage you to come forward. And if it's your desire to be known, the church will wait upon you while we sing a suitable hymn. If someone have a selection this morning. Sing 154. 154? Let's stand and sing 154 and give one another the right hand of Christian fellowship. 154.